Hey guys, and welcome to another episode of The Other Side of Sales. I'm Ryan Woodard. And I'm Ashley Early. And today we have Jenny Anderson, Regional Director of Sales at Data Robot and founder of Maggie, is a, prof- is a B2B success story. She comes from Appalachian roots and generational poverty, has been homeless, is the first person and her family to break six figures and proudly announces B2B sales changed her life. She's a passionate advocate for getting underrepresented people with non-traditional backgrounds into tech sales and knows the secret to diverse sales teams is hiring for who can, not just who has. Jenny? Hi. <laughs> like, man, did you like read that off of my LinkedIn or what? We like nailed uh, it. Just a, a little intake form that you filled out. Intake that, form. Uh, no, I love it. Love it. Thanks. Thanks for the intro. You're welcome. I, yeah. Thanks for being I gotta, here. I have to call out that hiring for people who can, not just people who have. I'm stealing that. <laughs> Steal. I'm, Steal away. I, I'm stealing. I'm giving credit, but I am stealing that. That is so good. Like hashtag it can over has like put it on t-shirts like yeah, yeah I've tried to make hi- I've tried to make hashtag hire for hustle a thing and it kind of <laughs> takes off occasionally every now and then but then people think it's like hustle mentality and it's like no no different thing altogether yeah. which we don't touch so walk us for people who aren't familiar with you and I'll be honest like you're people every once in a while people ask me, you know, how do you find guests for the show? And I'll be honest, a lot of it's just straight up LinkedIn stalking. And I saw one of your posts literally basically talking about your bio really quickly. Be like, just, I think you went on a little bit of a rant or something. And I was just like, yes, more examples of these. Yeah. So tell like, for those who don't who have, who aren't following you on LinkedIn or who do, aren't familiar with you yet, though they should be like, tell us like a little bit about what your sales journey has been like. Yeah, um, I'm gonna try to give like the Cliff Notes version, I guess. Um, so I, I like I said, I, I grew up in generational poverty. Um, most of my family is from the hills of Tennessee. The first woman to not be uh, in like work in a shirt factory or run a moonshine line in my entire like lineage that I can track down and trace. Um, and growing up, I didn't know like successful people. Um, the people who I was surrounded with were, um, like early career sailors, um, truck drivers and people who were like working really crummy blue collar jobs, you know, barely scraping by, um, you know, missing payments on, on their houses, having cars repossessed. So like there was no path to success. It was a path to survival for me. Um, and everyone that I was surrounded with, like with pockets, you know, of maybe like an okayness here and okayness there. I think early childhood, I was sheltered from that. So whenever I left high school and went to college and inevitably like dropped out of college, I got kicked out because my grades sucked at like three semesters. It was like, what the hell do I do? And um, I became a flight attendant, weirdly enough. Um, and it did last long cause pay sucks. That's a whole other story. Um, but I moved back home and had zero skills, zero skills to like, uh, you know, have any kind of job. So I did what I saw all of my family do, which was go to temp agencies and apply for the same factory jobs that everyone else had gone to. I'm a, a very feminine girly, uh, vocal I think kind of a woman. So like that is not their profile. Um, and all of the recruiters I was talking to were like, yeah, you're, you don't really have what we're looking for. Um, and I like literally went to every, every recruiting office in in my town. And, um, someone's like, well, you know, you don't really have the skill set that we're looking for, but there's a flooring store that is hiring for someone. And, um, the, the owner of this flooring store was, you know, a husband and wife who owned the store. He took the interview with me because he saw I was a flight attendant and thought that I would have good stories. Um, and so he scheduled it during his lunch. And I remember sitting across the table from him and he was eating subway, like full on, like huge bites, just asking questions. Um, and I just showed up more professional than anyone else and could communicate better than other people. And he hired me, um, for like seven fifty an hour. And I was like, Oh my God, seven fifty an hour. It's above minimum wage, which was five fifteen at the time. 
And um, he would just toss me projects and, um, you know, it was like, hey, I need you to book ads here. Hey, I need you to build the ad for here. Hey, um, like, you know, we're thinking about doing this trade show. I need you to put together the booth. I need you to be the one that demands the trade show. And eventually um, I was doing trade shows for them. And I remember the very first time I did when I came home and I told my mom, if I could just talk to people and like learn what's going on in their life and then make recommendations, that's what I would do. And she was like, yeah, um, I think that that's sales. And I was like, BS. Cause in my head sales was like the insurance guy who came to our house and sat and tried to pressure my mom into buying a policy. It was the Mary Kay consultant who came to my house and, you know, swiped on some eyeshadow and then harassed my mom for months and years until she would buy something. It, it was the car dealer who, you know, was just really slimy and pressure sales. So like sales to me was not solving problems. It was like forcing someone, pressuring someone, harassing someone until they tell you yes. So like I, I denied it. And eventually like I got into car sales and then I got into retail sales. I had, um, I, in, in retail sales, I found my groove, uh, follow a process, learn about your clients, make recommendations. Um, I built a really successful career taking over underperforming locations and turning them around by focusing on like product and people and then pivoted into, you know, B2B sales, uh, like five years ago, you know, during that time, like I was homeless and living at a hotel, um, you know, five, gosh, almost six years ago. Um, I left my retail job managing tanning salons and my salary was $28,000 a year. And I was required to make 40, like work 45 hours a week. And most weeks it was like in the 50 to 55 range, giving up at least two nights a week, giving up at least two Saturdays during a month for, you know, 28K. And I had a client who, you know, was like, Hey, you know, I think that you should be good at this, uh, or you should try this. And, um, was just a super advocate. She brought me to B2B sales. And at that time it was like, somebody handed me the keys to the kingdom where I, I remember my mentor telling me about this, like four or five figure commission check that she was getting that month. And that was wild to me. Like, I can't tell you. And like, it could have been like seven grand, right? I, like seven grand was something that like felt life-changing to it's me. It's months of rent. It's, months, months, it's, months of rent. It like, yeah. it, it, it was, it was wild. And I was like, well, how did you do it? And then I started learning that it wasn't just her that was doing it. It was a lot of other people who were doing it. And then I was like shadowing them. And then I was learning from them. And then I was owning sales cycles on my own. And I was like, shit, I'm doing it better than they are. And then I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to do what I did in retail, which is like follow process and learn your product and focus on your people, make sure that your people do a good job. So like I, I pivoted really quickly into leadership and B2B and the rest is history, I guess, but it's been a weird journey. You know, I spent a lot of time in retail being awesome, but not getting paid really well for it. And then like B2B sales and tech sales specifically has just like completely, completely and entirely changed my life in like ways that are beyond financial, like confidence and the time and like what it's done for my family and what it's allowed me to do for other people completely changed my life. Yeah. Cause I was reading like you went back to school, you got pregnant, had a baby, yeah. Maggie, started a new job. You've been doing a whole lot. Um, so I feel guilty, you know, it's like the pandemic was good to me. Um, and so there's some like guilt with that, but it's, you know, I, I, I just six years ago, five and a half years ago, I guess, whenever I found B2B sales and it was like a switch you know, it's like somebody to turn the lights on and it's like, this is available to you. You know, for somebody who grows up in poverty, for somebody who grows up with surrounded by people who are always in survival mode, that that's all it is for you is survival mode. It's like a job is a job. It's not a career. A job is a means to an end. A job is an income and nothing else. Right. And maybe, maybe you find something that you enjoy. I enjoyed working in tanning salons. I enjoyed working in portrait studios, but, um, it, it wasn't anything that was like gonna consistently set me and my family up for success. Um, so, it, I mean, it's just like, like I said, the light came on, like, this is a world that's available to you now. Well, it's, it's interesting. You mentioned that because 
there's, I cannot tell you how many messages I get each week from people saying, oh, we're looking for SDR managers. We're looking for SDRs. We're looking for entry-level sales. You know, this is late 2021. You've got the great reshuffle, you know, resignation happening. And there is incredible demand for sales talent. And yet I, and we, we could talk about this in a couple of different things, but it, it's, I think you hit something there. It's really important that a lot of people, I think who grew up middle-class or upper-class don't quite understand because, and this is something that I started kind of lower middle class and ended up upper middle class. So I saw a bit, and I know enough people who grew up in extreme poverty that I've seen kind of the impact this can have. And a lot of sales leaders really struggle with this is if you come, if you're dealing with someone who is coming from extreme poverty, they literally do not know how to dream. No, it learned they, helplessness. Like, Exactly. It's, it's like the idea of like, Hey, you could make six figures. It's like, yeah, okay. And a unicorn could show up the next day. Those are equivalent right. ideas to a significant portion of the population. This is in the U S I'm not even going to start on the rest of the world, but, and then we have sales leaders who are like, Oh, well, they're not motivated. They're not driven. No, they just don't know. They, they honestly don't know. And they've been lied to so consistently by society. They've been told and we, and we still do this. I mean, we shame people for being on food stamps. We shame people for utilizing yeah. Medicare. It's ridiculous. And in, as a result, we develop into them a sense of inferiority that makes it like that's all they can ever be is a drain on society. And yeah. so like one of the things that it, it took me a few years to figure this out for myself was I would, when I was an early manager, one of my favorite things to do to source people was just to tell people what I did whenever I was in retail, I was in an Uber, I'm at a yeah. restaurant. I would just be like, this is what I do. And this is how much I make. Here's my card. Hit me up if you want a job. I did that. My husband can do this pitch now. He's heard me do it so many freaking times. <laughs> um, I've done that pitch probably 50 to hundred times. I've had three people in 10 years actually follow up. And it pissed me off for a long time. Cause I was like, I'm giving you the choice. Why aren't you taking advantage of it? And it took one of my coworkers actually being like, they think you're selling drugs or something like that because no one offers them that. So yeah. you're just, you're, you're a weird, crazy person who's not speaking reality. So I, I this is something I have very big and I think maybe diverse opinions on, um, that like there, there's some crossover between something that you're talking about, um, that you're right. If you grow up or if you're in, maybe not even grown up, but if you're stuck in survival mode, you're in survival mode, right? Like there's yeah. the whole like Pavlovian response, right. But like the, there's also this learned helplessness, which is, you know, if you're constantly told like you can't, or you won't, or you're subjected to the same thing over and over again, like that's, mm -hmm. that's your reality now right? Like that. And so that's just what you assume it like forever looks like. And you're right. If somebody comes to you and they're telling you like, Hey, this is an option for you. It you're right. You're selling drugs. And I see this happen a lot for women specifically getting into like MLM. Oh God. Right? Don't get me started. Because, but here, but like, hear me out on this. This is, this is, I think, like where sales fails people and where like this perception of sales, the reason why MLM are able to prey upon vulnerable people, mostly women, because it's like 80% of MLM participants are women yep. are because they show the promise. Hey, we're going to give you lucrative income. We're going to give you the ability to work from home. We're going to give you the ability to be a present wife and mother. We're going to give you the ability to like take back control of your life, to be a contributor. We're going to give you the ability to have a nice car and to have a nice income and to go on vacations. It's just, you got to work it to work. Right. And obviously it's a business model that's set up for intense and immense failure for 99% of people, but they are promising the dream, the community. Right. And it's people who they trust that are telling them this is an option for you. Yeah. And so in sales, whenever we're like, tell like you or I going to somebody, it's that like, if, if we're like meeting somebody at, you know, 
Burger King. And we're like, God, this person has such a great personality. Like, ah, you're so charismatic. I like when I bring you into my SDR team, um, they're like, but I've tried like seven MLMs and none of those worked. I don't like sales. Exactly. I'm not good at sales because that in MLM, the Mary Kay's, the, um, like Amway's, the pyramid schemes of the world, yeah, have all that. Yeah. Right. Have, have told them you're not good at sales. And it's not that you're not good at sales. It's that you're not good at being successful in a pyramid scheme because that 99% of people fail. It's a business model. Yep. Right. But if you look at the things that like you kind of have to do. And that is you have to be good at social marketing yourself and selling yourself and creating trust from the, from an early point, um, and creating connection. And you have to be comfortable cold messaging people and identifying your target audience. Like, man, that sounds like a skill set That's really, really, really great for an SDR right? Like those are all really killer skills for a salesperson. So how about like if we as sellers and as a sales industry started like showing and showcasing that like sales is an option. Like I, um, I I had a post, um, like on Facebook a few months ago where I was like, um, you know, six figure jobs, I, you know, aren't available to me or like, you know, work from good work from home jobs are a myth. Like yeah. something like that. And um, I was like, no degree, no MLM, no six figures, no BS. Yeah. And like it caught fire. Like I just had so many people from my like personal network who have known me for years, who have seen me in all of my different you know, roles and responsibilities, who have known that I've been in sales, who are like, what is it that you do? Tell me what, what it is that you do. Right. Because like for the first, like I'm, I, I was literally working with like my five-year-old asleep on the couch behind me, my baby in my lap. And I was like, you know, nursing and I had, you know, he'd woken up and he was a picture and it was suddenly like, oh my God, like if Jenny can do it, I can do it. Yeah. And like that, you know, was one of the reasons that I have Maggie. It's because, and I've, like I've said over and over again, Maggie isn't for me. It's for women like me because that like, we've all been lured by, you know, someone saying, oh, well, this is for you or or tempted. I think there are so many women from where I'm from that have been tempted by MLM. I'm like, no, don't do MLM, do, do BDB sales, do yeah. SAT sales. Like the roles are mostly remote now. Like there are some freedoms that you get, right? Like you have normal working hours. And it's, it's, crazy. it's understanding the mechanism of success. The mechanism of success in, in an MLM is to get other people to sell for you. Right. Mechanism of success in B2B sales or in professional sales is solving problems exactly to yep. your point. Like I understand makeup solves problems. I understand my, my mom did Mary Kay for years. I know. And the other thing they don't tell you about all the MLMs is, and we talk about this all the time in sales, it's territory planning. Mm -hmm. you are you're creating thing. your competition. You're if you're like, your competition. But more to that, like it's entirely likely that unless your friend who got you into it is in another state, you already have a ton of competition around you. You don't know about yep. Yep. versus if it's like, oh, it's my friend who and our kids go to the same school, your school is screwed. You have no oh, territory. Right. You have no right. territory. That territory yep. is snapped. You're done. Versus if like, and I have a family member who is, makes an incredible living in an MLM. And I have very mixed feelings about that. And she knows that. <laughs> um, yeah. But it, part of the reason why she's so successful is three big things. One, she is a brilliant artist in terms of photography. And so she got into it and she got onto Instagram early. Two, she got into her specific organization early. So she basically set up the entire West Coast. And three, she has an incredible story and is an incredible human being. And this is where it gets really kind of sucky for me. She uses, um, she is a, she, she's a foster mom. She and her husband have taken in a, a bunch of foster kids. They've adopted two, you know, it, it's an incredible, amazing, beautiful story. And it's, it's, it's struggles to have all these ethical concerns about MLMs. But again, it comes back to the same thing where we see this all the time. People are like, oh, I can't do sales because I couldn't do an MLM or I don't want to do sales because I don't want to be this this used car people, right? Yeah. I don't want to pressure people. And it's like, this is where we, what we need to do some, and I, this is why I got so excited when, um, full shout out to sales loft, who's actually was one of our partners in the sales census. They did this beautiful video 
on what modern selling is and what it is not recently. And I was just watching it. I was like almost crying because I was like, thank you. You're someone's finally spelling this out and trying to do some rebranding on our profession because one of the hardest things we've got to go up against is that stigma that sales is manipulating people into buying. And yep. even our buyers think we're doing that. Yep. Like how often do you call someone like, oh my God, I get calls from 10 of you a day. How are you different from anyone else? I'm not, but you answered the phone and I'd like to just like 30 seconds. And if I can't help you, I'll go away. No problem. Right. Um, there are others that won't and they suck and we'll call them out and tell them they suck. But <laughs> like it, it's, we, we've really got a, We've really got a branding problem as an industry. Yeah. both from a professional ethics standpoint for how we conduct ourselves like internally, but also from how we're going to get people into this industry. Yeah. And keep, no, it, totally. going, keep it evolving. Totally agree. Well, it's like, I, um, there's like one, one candidate for every 12 job openings in sales right now, and that's skills matched candidates. I think that's important to, to like, just throw that out there. That's not people who have experience, which is why I'm really big on like the can over has, because if we're only ever focusing on people who have done the job or who have done a similar job, right. Or who have like, whatever is that one, the talent pool is always going to look the same. And there's a lot of really positive, really powerful conversations happening around the need for more diversity in sales. Right. Um, so if we're only recruiting for experience, like our talent pool is only going to look like the people who have experience, but also like if we're going to continue to be sellers and be successful and be able to like grow our businesses, um, because sales has to be like the, the heart of the organization to be able to drive revenue, right? You can't have a talent shortage and we are failing people, not just from a branding perspective, right? Where, and I, I would, I haven't seen the video. I'm going to like watch it now, but where are we putting that video? Are we putting on a new YouTube? Are we putting on TikTok? Are we putting on Facebook? Are we putting on Instagram? Because the, if we're putting on, on LinkedIn, that's not where yeah, that's not the target audience. That's not our target audience y'all. Right. So we got to change that. Right. But like, it is changing the perception of sales, but, um, also bringing sales jobs and to communities that need them. Right. Like I think about where I'm from, there are no tech companies in Cookville, Tennessee, period, point blank, nothing. Maybe an hour and a half away in Nashville, Knoxville, or Chattanooga, not Cookville, Tennessee. Cookville, Tennessee is a, like one of the larger micropolitan areas in, in the nation, which means that there are people that drive in from like a 45 to an hour radius to come to work, to play, to go to school there. It's a college town even. And there are about 30 to 40,000 people that actually live in the town. Poverty rate is really high. Um, and most of the jobs are blue collar manufacturing jobs or retail and, or medical, because like there are a lot of nurses, there's a hospital there, whatever. Right. Um, yes, teachers, services. right. Services. Um, and every town like that in Tennessee has some kind of rural economic development district every single one of them. And those rural economic de development districts work really hard to attract manufacturers to the areas. And then those manufacturers then create manufacturing jobs, blue collar jobs, which are not easy on the body and also don't pay a really great wage. And in addition to that, um, the community colleges in the area have certificate programs that then push people into those manufacturing jobs, blue collar, low wage manufacturing jobs. But then you have dozens and dozens of temp agencies that spring up around that area that those employers are not the ones making direct hires. They're then going to the temp agencies. So then the temp agencies for a great deal of time are then getting a portion of that person's wages. So we're continuing to like depress the wages in the area. So you can see how this is like a total problem. And then whenever you have low wages, you have low education, you have low home ownership, you have um, low family incomes and higher rates of obesity and higher rates of um, preventable diseases. Like there's just so much that happens whenever you're in poverty and in economically depressed areas. But like, this would be crazy. What if we, instead of focusing on rural economic development, on bringing low wage manufacturing jobs to communities, thought like, let's bring some tech jobs 
to these communities, right? Like if a boot camp can be able to put someone through a self-led learning program in 20 hours and successfully place them, or can put someone through um, a 12 week training course that they can work around a regular job um, or a six or eight week training course around a regular job and make them a successful seller in an organization, why on earth are community colleges, which in Tennessee are completely free for the first two years? Like, why, why aren't we creating more tech talent? And that's not just tech sellers. That could be coders. It could be data scientists. It could be like any number of things, right? But like, there are so many towns and communities that are like that, that like are continually perpetuating the same problems that they're trying to solve. And for me, tech is the answer. Like tech is eating the world. We've all heard that quote, right? So if tech is eating the world, why are we leaving underrepresented and underserved communities behind? It just doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, it makes you wonder, uh, you know, don't like to throw in politics, but like we have an aging political hierarchy that, you know, when I watched the, um, what was it? Like the Google and the tech companies went to Congress or whatever. And like the guy's asking like, so can you tell me, is Google tracking me right now? And he's like, well, did you opt in? He's like, yes. it's a yes or no question. It's they like, are, they are. If you're listening and you're not sure, yes, Facebook and Google right. own your soul, surrender to the overlords. Right. Yeah. Well, like that's so also there's... a really, really good point, right? Like we're talking about like political affiliations and, um, and, like voting for your, for what's in your best interest. And in a lot of economically depressed areas, they're, they're not voting in their best interest, no. right? But if you think about it, and I think this is a bigger challenge, is if you're in poverty, you don't have time to involve yourself in politics. No, right? it's a and luxury. So, right? It, it's a luxury to be able to involve yourself in politics, but not just that, um, but like, in, and I'm going to use the South as, as an example, there's a lot tied to faith. Um, and then politicians have then used our faith in order to be able to, to pander and, and sway votes, right? Shame, shamelessly. Shamelessly, right? And so we're, we're voting with our hearts rather than policy. And although we would love to say that, like, those things should be intertwined, they're typically not. But it, politics and political affiliation voting for what's in your best interest are luxuries and whenever you're in survival mode like being able to consume what tiny bit of information to be able to make an educated vote on facebook is as much as you can give right like that's as much as you can give and that i think creates a huge problem in that like we see a very big divide between the coasts and middle America. And then there's also a very big divide between tech jobs on the coasts versus middle America, right? And then not only that, but I would say that largely a lot of these politicians, like they have not lived the lives of their constituents. They do not know no. what it's like to be in poverty. They do not what, know what it's like to wonder where your next meal is going to come from or to be paycheck to paycheck or anything oh, and their like health care is covered and they have maternity and paternity leave unlike you know 99 percent of the u.s right i mean there's all of these things right and for me my my experience has been that b2b and tech very specifically has provided those things health insurance on day one right like now if i were to get pregnant i would have eight weeks of leave in my current job i didn't have that luxury at a prior company but like i there are things in tech and especially in startup tech and in vc funded tech where you get a lot of those things training and community and empowerment and the ability to volunteer and like additional benefits that help like set you up for success from a family standpoint right like there and Holy smokes, if we could bring those to these underserved and underrepresented communities that don't have access or don't aren't aware of them, like in Cookville, Tennessee, nobody's like, hey, did you know about a tech job that that can be an option for you that like you're remote and you have a really great retail background or that you've got a really great charismatic personality and you're not afraid to hear no, or that you've been homeless and hungry and um, like you will do literally anything that it takes to make sure that you are not gonna do that to your children. Like, I'm here to tell you that I know plenty of people, plenty of people who would like 
punch a grandma or a baby in the face if it meant that their kids weren't going to follow in the same like poverty trap that they've been in. Well, and here's let's, let's 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 take this and take that exact scenario and put it into a real world scenario that happens every day, which is you have two people who are underperforming on a sales team. Mm -hmm. Which one do you think is going to say uncle first? The person who's dealt with homelessness, who's faced hunger, who has kids and who will not fail, who refuses or, and no shade implied here at all, because I know many of these people and they can be great sales reps as well, but realistically life has not thrown them the same curveballs. Somebody who got a full ride athletic scholarship to a second tier school. Right. And you know, that's not to say that like, and like the, the types of grit are very different, right? Like exactly. I don't like- It's not a zero kind of, sum game. And that's, and that's you know what I mean? It's but people, but we're, we're saying that the athlete, it, but yeah, you look at hiring descriptions, you look at recruiting strategies, you look at talent pools. Exactly. Company after company after company prioritizes the athlete yep. over someone who pulled themselves up by their bootstraps. Yep. And it- boggles my mind. And it's not a zero sum. It's not an, it's not a one or the other. I'm saying, why are you eliminating a huge talent pool? Right. It makes no sense. Right. Like I, if, if I were, and it, like maybe the recruiters listen here on this one, if I were hiring for an SDR team today and like I manage and hire for AEs, but if I were hiring it and like looking for an SDR team today, um, I know plenty of hiring managers who are looking for people who have been at, at who have been in SDR roles in other organizations. Yep. That's how they're trying to find talent. Because, right? they, think, because like, they think they don't have time to train. Right. I don't have time to train. Um, or like, oh my gosh, we're, you know, um, we're a rocket ship. We're trying to get to the next phase. We can't do it with B plus talent. Right. So it's that assumption that like, oh, anyone who doesn't have, who hasn't done the job, isn't able to do the job. Right. But if I were hiring for an SDR team today, I would look at, I would like go on Indeed or Facebook or like it link because these people are not on LinkedIn. And I would look for people who have been like retail who have okay. been retail bankers, who have been um, like former MLM. Like I, um, I would look at teachers and nurses and I would just like, hey, I get that this is probably not on your radar, but like, I have a job for you. What you're doing today and in insert role, these are the transferable skills I know that somebody like you brings to the table. And this is the kind of income that this opportunity presents base on target earnings. Can I have a conversation? And then whenever you get on the conversation, that recruiter should then go into sales mode. Like, let me tell you about the opportunity that we have here. Are you like, can, can we continue this conversation? Because like what we're doing is we're expecting for people who are wildly unaware of these jobs to come to us with a resume that tells us their transferable skills that tells us why they're the right candidate, right? And if you're somebody who's only been in blue collar in retail, right, in like pink collar jobs even, right? Then how you apply for those jobs is not the same how you would apply for an SDR job or for an AE job, right? Like it's just not. And so to be, and I, again, like I'm gonna kind of pick on recruiters a bit here and just hiring managers who, who kind of play, wear both hats. We're looking, we're expecting for people to be able to tell us those transferable skills whenever they have no idea the kind of jobs that they're applying for. And what that means is that we're alienating hundreds of thousands of candidates who would millions, probably make, millions, right? Like make really exceptional talent for a sales role, right? Because that we're looking at this very niche profile. I want you to have a degree because that shows that you've what been able to pay for college or that you've been like, okay with paying $40,000 in student loans, or that you had the luxury of like being able to focus on school full time and like balance a part time job like insert whatever privilege there is. And like I say that as somebody who's in school now I realize what a privilege it is to be in school. Right. Um, so it's like we want a degree. And like this person had to have a lot of things go really right for them to be able to get to that point. Right. And, um, okay, well, if they don't have a degree, 
then I need them to have been an SDR. Or if they don't have a degree, like I need them to have, you know, I'll, I'll take somebody who can over has, but they need to tell me what they like, how they can, like, how do you do that on a resume? And now we're like abandoning cover letters at the same time. And oh, like they should be telling me with their LinkedIn profile, like 90 something percent of LinkedIn users have a degree, like quipping jerks. It's just like the system is broken on how we hire for early career sales talent. And what we're, we're doing is like statistically failing us in really major ways because failure rates of SDR is really high. The tenure of an SDR is really low. Um, and well, I mean, I, they, I'll, I'll, and I'll give you another one. There was a study that was released recently. I forget where I'll go to see if I can find the stat, but found the average tenure of a woman in a tech company was under 10 years. That's wild. No, no, and not, not at a company in tech period, a majority wild. of women do not stay in tech more than 10 years. That's like, such a problem. It's, 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 so it's, it's like, okay, we're like, really, we're, we're crap in the bed on getting talent in and then like once you're in the bed we're also going to steal all of your covers right so it's like oh man like i i'd rather sleep on the floor yeah you know like it's just such a pain and and like we're 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 all going to to suffer for it right tech is not getting smaller right the problems that tech solves are not getting smaller if anything they're getting bigger um, the competition is not being wedged out. We're adding more competitors, right? Like we're now hiring on a national and global scale, right? So we're not just focused on our tiny little suburbs or, you know, metro areas. And so now we're competing with talent on a national scale. Like the good and thing some is of that, that tech displaces some of these right. jobs too. So, right. No, you're absolutely right. So it's like the option the only option, in my opinion, is that we have to democratize access to tech jobs, period. Full stop. That's the only option. And so anybody who like, how do we do that? So I think yeah. one is um, changing hiring practices, right? And this is something, and I think that there's a lot of really, really great conversations being had around like diversity and equity and inclusion and um, really meaningful, powerful conversations. What is happening with a lot of those conversations is like what happens when someone's in and that's super important, right? Mm -hmm. Like we have to make sure that there's an environment that it, that does have an inclusion and that people are feel really encouraged and empowered to be part of. But I think that what happens maybe a little less is how do we hire for that? And it's, and it's not just like hiring specifically for diversity, but like adding more diverse candidates to your pipeline, right? It's, it's not, um, you know, in tech referrals are really big. Um, if I referred from my network, my network might look like a very different or a very specific kind of profile, right? Like I attract a lot of women to me. So like, as, as my company is growing, I want to make sure that I can continue to attract women and add them to the talent pipeline. Right. Um, mm -hmm. so like adding into that, like you need to have women on your hiring um, on your hiring teams. You need to have people of color on your hiring teams. You, um, whenever it's possible, you need to include someone who is like LGBTQIA on your hiring teams, right? And, if and you just can't include someone who is of those denominations, at least have some sort of public statement around yes. what you're doing to actively make it a safe space yeah. for that community. Um, like something I've seen with LGBTQ is because it, you, you can't ask people like, you know, it, it shouldn't be, people shouldn't have to be out at work if they don't want to be, but right. you can do a lot to make indicate it's a safe space by just putting, by considering LGBTQ health concerns in your healthcare plans and yep. just posting that on your job site. Yep. No, you're absolutely right. And then like job postings need to change, right? Yep. Like we need to lower our requirements. Like if, if there are some nice to haves, then your hiring managers need to know those. Your recruiters need to know those. Your job description does not need to have those nice to haves, mm -hmm. right? Like, like those are nice to haves. Cool. But what we need to do is to be able to get more people in our talent pipeline. And whenever we're excluding people, even from like the job description, that is a problem. Right. And, and so like, I think hiring in general is, is really broken. Um, like I, I, I called BS on IST hiring practices, ageist 
elitist, <laughs> classist, racist, right? Like homophobic. Like there are just so many types of hiring practices that are our interview process and our job description process is like really kind of playing against. Um, and I think that there should be some like really robust training around um, hiring for who can over has. Like the questions you ask are really important, right? That like your questions, if I'm hiring for an AE in my role, for example, and I ask someone, hey, like, what is your quota, right? Like, what is your annual quota? What is your performance against that quota? If I ask that question of an SDR versus an AE candidate, the AE is always gonna have the better answer. If I'm recruiting for SDRs and I ask a question around like, hey, what is your sales performance and your target? They may not be able to answer that. Someone in retail could answer that. A teacher may not be able to. Right. So how do we look for can over has is hypercritical and to be able to do that for people who are coming from other professions like there has been a mass exodus of nurses from the field, there has been a mass exodus of mm -hmm. teachers from the field right. Um, those were very hard hit during the pandemic, they have degrees largely female fields like why the hell are we not trying to do everything we can recruit from them blows my mind. Right. And then you talk about like the people like me who are coming from retail, who are coming from blue collar jobs, who are coming like I, the construction workers or painters, you know, like there, there are other kinds of, of work that like you have to have some interpersonal skills for, um, you know, like if I owned my own painting company, I would have to find my own business. Right. I would have to like know my territory planning, oh, outbounding, marketing strategy, right. positioning, differentiation oh language. God. Right. Like there are so many things that, but like, I also don't know many painters who would be able to accurately describe those skills on a resume. Like if you were to look up that person on Indeed today, it's just gonna be like painter at Bob's painting company, right? Or owner operator, insert like small, like, you know, auto body shop or whatever. Like we should be able to, to look at that and be able to try to screen people into our interview process for early career sellers rather than screening people out and then have a conversation. It's going to take more time. Yeah, for sure. But to be able to have conversations with someone and to identify, okay, is there some charisma here? Is there some passion? Are they asking me questions? Are they conversing with me? You know, and if it's somebody who's just like really pleasant, like, is there a customer support role in our organization that could be good for this person and that we can get them like used to talking to people and like solving problems in a way that's not sales. And then I can pull them into my sales team later, right? Like there are just like so many different ways that we can be creating early career sales talent from, you know, diverse backgrounds that it's silly that we're still hanging on to like degree and prior experience requirements, because basically what it means is that there are only a handful of large companies that have the, the ability to hire early career sellers, right? Like the ADPs and the universes of the world. And as great and robust as their training is, like I just, Enterprise is another great example. I just called BS on like that they're the only companies that are able to do it. Yep. No doubt. No doubt. Man, this has been awesome. Kind of just letting you spitball <laughs> on uh, all these challenges with hiring. I'm part of the hiring process here at Edify now. So you gave me kind of some, some notes to walk away with. Um, I don't like to like toot my own horn, but I hired somebody that came from publishing and took kind of that risk. And she was the um, and I don't say this like insulting, but she was the least competent, the least confident and the least experienced. And she is the top performer now. Yeah. She super open to coaching. Like I felt like I could tell her like, Hey, just run through that wall and you might hurt a little bit, but you're going to run through the wall. Like yeah. that wall is not that hard. And she would just be like, okay. And yeah. she'd run through it and just consistently over and over. And it was like, once the those first like kind of lessons hit, she just trusted and kept doing it and kept doing it. And 
it, you know, this is like a testimony to exactly what you're saying when you like hire outside of the norm. And then once they're in the organization, you don't just take all the covers off and like, all right, well, good luck sleeping in the yeah. cold. Uh, you actually like continue to build that up. You give them a sheet, you give them a pillow, you give them a comforter. Uh, you put a heater in the room. Like, yeah, they're like going to be successful. Thing. Yeah. Well, I would say like there, there are a couple of things. I would say that there are three reasons why somebody should hire for experience um, for early career sellers. And like three reasons, and this is it, is um, you lack the training curriculum. You can't, you couldn't train somebody, right? You're so early career or you're so early in your company um, processes that um, it's the wild west and um, putting somebody without experience into that to let them figure it out would end up in failure, right? So like you, you have zero foundation to be able to start somebody with would be like, okay, I need to hire for experience. The second thing was be ready be to pay that. for it. Right. But you got to pay for that experience because you can't just like hire for experience and be like, all right, I'm going to pay it 20% less than market value. Like if you're going to hire for experience, that's going to be your first hire. You need to make sure they're successful. You're going to continue to make a lot of mistakes in the process, but like you need to hire for that. That So like, I think that that is a reasonable time to hire for experience over like potential. The second um, would be is um, if you have a leader who is maybe really new in role, who is um, like learning the processes themselves, right? Mm -hmm. Like there are some, I, I know I'm facing that now in my current role. I'm new, I'm learning a lot about my company and having a new team. And so like there are, there is some friction there. Um, there are other things that I bring to the table that makes it like less friction, right? But from experience, if you're hiring just purely off of potential, especially for early career sellers, um, you like having a brand new manager who's just trying to figure stuff out at the same time that they're going to try to like level there's up. A, there's actually an aviation term for this called green on green. And in aviation, yeah. there's always a pilot and a co-pilot. You never yeah. have a pilot paired with a co-pilot who has a similar or less basically, or like if right. you're within, I think it's the first two years yeah. on an aircraft or something, or under a certain number of hours. Like if you are in that green period, you will never be paired with someone who is also that green period because it's not right. fair because neither can yep. catch either. You have to have green on someone who's, who's a more veteran. That's yep. completely, and a lot of people, a lot of people think it's like, oh, I'm going to hire some new sales manager who's never done it before and give them a bunch of new people who've never done it before. This will totally be fine. It's exhausting. Yeah. Um, there are a lot there. Like I've, I've done this before. It's exhausting. There's a lot of learning curve that happens. Right. I would say like the way that you can balance that is by hiring more experienced sellers and then also hiring people that maybe have a little less experience who like are potential hires. So that way you're not just like fully like, oh my gosh, I've got to like upskill everyone on my team at the same time. Um, or make but sure that would be and bring in external support. Not everything right. has to be now. Bring in external support. Like yep. you can do that. Green on green can work if properly supported. Right. If properly but supported it's, is big. But, it's, yep. but it's not cheap. It's going to cost you something. So whatever yep. you might be saving in salary, you're going to eat in the first six months. Yep. Absolutely. Make your pen and then the Yep. And then the third would be if you have a manager who is, um, and I would say that this is a cultural problem. And I would argue that this manager doesn't belong in the organization. But if you have a manager who um, does not believe in developing their people, if you have a manager who thinks that their job is um, like accountability and numbers and like nothing else, like they're not going to train, they're not going to develop, they're not going to coach, they're not going to guide, they're going to support their job is just to be like, okay, hey, you got to show up and, and do. And whenever you don't show up and do, I'm going to come down on you. If that's the kind of leadership, yeah, you do not need an early career seller. That, so that's like, not those are manager. Only three. no, no, that's terrible not manager. manager, period. No, 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 not at all. So I would say that's that those would be like, right. Those would be the only three circumstances that like, you couldn't hire for potential over experience. But outside of that, if you've got training and support and you've got leaders who focus on coaching, developing and inspiring their people, and they've, they've got some experience themselves. And if they don't have the experience, again, going back to support all day, like, and, and balance it, right? Like if you're, if, if you're coming into an organization and like, this is a new thing for that organization to hire for who can over has like, 
hire a couple of people for who can over has prove out the model and then like slowly shift that right like there's just a lot of um i think that there's a lot of well like no one's done it so i'm not going to try um and so we just don't try at all and then we end up in the same situations there are organizations who are doing exceedingly well at hiring for who can over has and we all should be doing everything we possibly can to be able to mirror that kind of success because it's just it. not sustainable otherwise I love it I love it so many gems in this uh interview so I'm gonna I'm gonna be excited for all the editing and so forth fun stuff <laughs> to happen so I can listen to this again um we end the show the same way we always do it's a series of rapid fire questions nothing too serious uh so just give us your first reaction okay. don't don't stress okay. and we'll go through these i'll lead off and then ashley and i will, will alternate so okay. what's your morning routine uh wake up read the news check my socials all Simple right enough. I'm amazed people still check the news first thing in the morning. That's like mental health number one for me as I cut that out. But let's do this. Pick one person who's had a significant impact on your career. Uh, career. Um, my husband. Easy. Um, like I, I was like searching for like a manager, but I'm like, no, my husband's had the single bit. Like he took a huge sacrifice. I'm going to cry um, to be a stay at home dad. So that way I could just like pursue like these crazy ambitious career goals and dreams that I have. Um, so if it, if it weren't for him, like none of this would be. So definitely my husband. Awesome. Kudos to him. What's your, uh, your pump up song? Oh man. Um, pump up song. Is it weird? I don't have one. I, I have a, a song that like really like gets me. Um, I would say like the one that really gets me going is like a song by um, the Civil Wars called Barton Hollow. And it is like not a good like pump up song. But if I'm like listening to it, I'm just like, yes. Um, I think it just like ties into my Appalachian roots or something. It's just like, you know, bluegrassy and like gritty and gets me in the feels. I nice. love that. What's one thing you wish you'd learned earlier? Uh, that tech sales was a career path for me and yeah, or B2B sales was a career path in me. I like lived in um, outside in the, the triangle area of North Carolina um, at the same time that a lot of my peers were there and working um, with like AppDynamics and BMC. And I think like, man, if I would have been able to leverage the call center experience that I had then to be able to become an SDR with them at that point, like, where would I be today? Um, so for me, just like the awareness of the profession. Nice. What uh, book has had the biggest impact on your sales career? Um, not even a sales book. It's called Hand to Mouth. Um, it's uh, a book um, written by a woman who experienced poverty. And um, I guess her personal experiences about being a poor person and what that means. And like, I just, I felt it and it's what inspired me to figure out, okay, like what was, how did I get out? The answer was B2B sales. And then how do I help other people do the same? All right. What's one way someone could have been a better ally to you? Um, gosh, this is a tough one. I would say being, um, being a coach, not a cheerleader. There's a difference, a pretty big yeah. difference between two things. Huge difference. Most definitely. I can already probably guess your answer to this next one, but <laughs> what one way you're working to be a better ally for others? Uh, yeah, just Maggie, Maggie, for sure. Like it's, um, I, I say it all the time. It's not for me. It's for women like me. There are just thousands, millions of women across the U.S. who are like me, who just didn't know that this was an option for them. And if I can impact even a small sliver of those women and help them be able to change their lives, their families' lives, the trajectory of their children's lives and their grandchildren's lives through jobs in B2B sales, that's that's like how I'm going to get back to the world. That's my legacy. Tagging, I'm going to be tagging Galem on this. All right. <laughs> and last question. What's your guilty pleasure after a long day? Um, hot fries. I love the hot bag, fries. like, like, yeah, like, like Cheetos, hot fries, like not your okay. hands are don't, all don't bastardize 
hot fries by bringing Cheetos into the game. Okay. okay. Like okay. hot fries, just Talkies. like regular, like Chester hot fries, like Chester Cheetah hot fries or whatever. I'm going to have to take a picture and send you because like it's a yellow and red bag. It's there are some days that like I'll, you know, at the end of the day, my husband will be like, Hey, I'm going to run in the store. And then he'll come back with like a Coke Zero and a bag of hot fries. I'm like, okay, it's been that kind of day. And we both know it. <laughs> and your fingers are like covered in the dust. Oh, and... always covered in the red dust. Oh, yep. I never got into those. Huh? Ugh, hot fries is a super guilty pleasure. I love it. Well, Jenny, I want to thank you again for joining us today. Where can our listeners find you? Uh, they can find me uh, being pretty loud and vocal about stupid is tiring practices and democratizing access to tech um, on LinkedIn. Uh, that's where I am a lot. Um, I have some ambitious plans and goals for next year. I'm trying to go across all social medias. Uh, but for now, LinkedIn is the best place. Um, if you know someone, a woman who's trying to break into tech sales or who could benefit from a tech sales career, you can send them to um, maggieco.io. Um, and I'm building the next cohort and have some really exciting news to share with the world uh, pretty soon about Maggie. Um, but just funnel them to us. Um, we got to get more women in the, in, the, in the profession and just more people from you know, the kinds of non-traditional backgrounds in general. And we'll be sure to include all that on the description for the episode. And as always, you can find us in the other side of sales at othersideofsales.com, on Twitter at OSOS underscore pod, on Instagram at other side of sales, and on LinkedIn at other side of sales. So please like, share the episode, and don't forget to subscribe and leave reviews as it really helps us boost visibility. Until next time, I'm Ryan. And I'm Ashley. And thank you for joining us and Jenny on the other side of sales today.